One of the most challenging parts of watercolor painting is not knowing which color to start with. And this basic decision of your first layer of colors is so important because it gives us a foundation for every intricate detail we want to capture along the way. Sort of a color map that guides us through the process of creating a truly realistic artwork. So in this video, I'm going to break it down into three simple steps, decision points that you can apply to your favorite subjects and as always with a little bit of color science sprinkled in between so you can be confident in your approach. And I'm going to use this blue bird as an example so we can go through the layers step by step. Before we get into specific tips on color selection, I'm going to sketch the bird and remind you about the fundamental rule of watercolor that we need to remember at all times. We can't erase our brush strokes or cover them with lighter paints, which is why we always paint light to dark, leaving the light areas behind and building the shadow layers gradually. And therefore, the entire process of color selection always goes in one direction, from highlights to shadows. Which brings me to tip number one for choosing your first set of colors. As a rule of thumb, they will likely be the lightest colors you see in the reference photo. In this example, our bird is dark blue, almost black, but the highlights which you see on the back and on top of the bird's head are definitely very light. I see a variation of blue and turquoise, maybe even some purple, so in my first layer of color, these are the exact pigments I'm going to use. Later, I will show you how I follow the same decision-making process on the yellow and red pomegranates, but for now, notice that my colors are super diluted. I want to have just a hint of pigment, leaving myself plenty of room to build shadows on top. Specific pigments I use, because I know you're wondering, are Thylo Blue Green Shade, Thylo Turquoise, and Diaxazine Purple. All of them are very staining, non-granulating, so just a little bit of pure color and no texture. All three are from Core by Golden, so they're very vibrant, even when you add a ton of water. And no, I did not wet my paper first. Even though I didn't, this is still called a wet on wet technique. I simply used a very diluted blue, applied a thin layer, and then dropped a bit of more saturated color onto that wet surface. Now I'm going to let my painting dry, follow with my second layer of color using wet on dry method and share tip number two for choosing your initial pigments. This one is a bit heavier on the theory but bear with me because this will be very useful when you do this on your own using your own references. So colors you want to use in your painting, especially in the beginning, are a combination of two things. The natural coloring of an object, in this case dark blue bird with some green and brown spots, and the light conditions around it. In this case, all the different reflections and shadows that fall on the bird and modify its original color. In other words, the feathers are always the same color, even if the bird is in the dark, but what we see and what we paint depends not just on this natural coloring itself, but how the sunlight illuminates it. For example, the tips of the wing feathers are actually a bit brown, but it's only visible at a certain angle, so I might glaze a bit of extra warm color in that area, more so on the tips. The back has some green and purple, and we've captured most of it in our underpainting, but it's only visible when you look at it at a certain angle. In the shadow areas on the left and at the bottom, those feathers look almost black, and so I will cover them with dark blue and even purple, gradually making them darker and darker so they match what we actually see versus what they are if you were to remove this condition of light and just look at each individual feather up close. I'm going to loosely paraphrase the brilliant David Briggs from the Color Society of Australia and say that the color you see is not just a physical property of an object or a bird in this case. It's subject to an observer, that would be you, and the conditions of light. To put it simply, there is a color of an object, there are your own eyes looking at that object and seeing the color of that object, and then there's how light affects what you observe. And the combination of these two things is what we want to capture on paper to create truly realistic result. 
I'm going to paint my darkest layer now using the same pigments I've used so far and maybe a bit of indigo for the darkest shadows. Never black for natural subjects like birds especially because I don't want the final result to look too harsh. And now notice how at this stage some of that vibrant underpainting, the colors we used in the beginning, are still shaping up the overall look, shining through the diluted pigments I'm applying at this moment. So tip number three for choosing your initial colors is to always remember that underpainting affects the way you see your subsequent layers, often changing the colors completely. Notice for example how the tips on the wing feathers look quite brown at the moment. You might be surprised to hear that I didn't use brown at all. In the second layer I used kind of a reddish orange pigment called Quinacridon Scarlet and when I glazed it on top of blue it came out looking brown. Essentially what happens is the two colors, blue and orange, are roughly on the opposite sides of the color spectrum. So putting them on top of one another creates a neutral mix. My version is a little bit brown. If I were to use less scarlet, it would look more gray. I'm not a color expert, but I've learned exactly what to expect from specific color combinations over time using basic color theory, which I often speak about on this channel, and a lot of trial and error. I'm stressing this because I want you to know for sure that you will get this right, you will get better over time the more you experiment and test different color combinations. Progress is inevitable, just like frustrations sometimes along the way are also inevitable. Just make sure you have good cotton paper and don't be afraid to glaze and layer your colors. A lot of glazing and a lot of layers is the secret to real depth. And now that the bird is finished, I will apply the same principles of color selection to my pomegranates, painting a very light yellow on this first pair, maybe adding a few spots of red and green, wet into wet. Simply blocking the lightest areas and maybe mapping out additional colors that I will definitely make a lot darker, just not at this stage. The other fruits are a bit more red in the reference photo, so I'm choosing more red there, maybe a little bit of cooler magenta and even some purple for my initial layer to hint at the shadow color that will come later on. I will even add green here and there, especially closer to the green leaves, because I know it's coming in the next two layers, so it only makes sense to map it out at this stage. Everything is very watery and very light, and I will let this map of color dry out so I can add proper midtones, shadows, and texture in the next stage. Always working from light to dark, building my colors slowly and choosing only the lightest colors for the first layer. Notice that in the second layer, in the third layer of color, I am much more generous with my reds, but everything we've established during the underpainting stage is still coming through to a degree. Watercolor is a transparent medium, so every layer you apply will always reveal the background colors, which is why the initial pigments I applied continue to affect how other, mostly red pigments, I put on top are perceived. Sometimes they serve as a shadow, sometimes they simply amplify the base color. This is why underpainting colors we choose are so important. It takes a bit of practice and I mean a lot more practice and just a little bit of theory because you will eventually get used to overlaying certain pigments to get the results you want. By the way, you may have noticed that this composition is quite similar to the sunbird and lemons tutorial I did on this channel a while back. This video has the most views, so I decided to do another variation. There's a real-time Patreon tutorial for this composition, about three and a half hours long, with detailed explanations for every stroke, an outline and step-by-step -step photos if you're interested in painting along. This one, a blue sunbird variation, 
section is rather similar and it uses the same technique so I won't make it into a full class but you guys keep asking me to share the process anyway even if I'm just playing around so maybe I will start a new tier on Patreon at a lower cost and also share full recordings of watercolor explorations like this one. It's about six hours long. I'll add a list of colors and put some music in the background. Let me know what you think of this idea and the fully narrated real-time tutorial on my Patreon channel this month will feature this beautiful bird. I'm recording and explaining every technique and every stroke and around the bird we'll add some tropical greenery so that should be a great learning experience for us as well. The last question I will address, and I know some of you may have been thinking about this throughout, is why we even need all these layers? Why not just use saturated colors right away, the same ones we picked for our underpainting, and just leave it at that? It's more straightforward, theoretically it takes less time, and we won't need to worry about transparency affecting how the colors look when we glaze. And the answer is very simple. Glazing or layering adds more depth and makes it a lot easier to get the exact color placement right because the colors just don't blend into one another as they do in one layer application. Yes, it's possible more or less to capture everything, the essence of a pomegranate or bird like this using just one layer of color, maybe two maximum. In fact, I do use this approach sometimes. I use two layers in this composition on the bird's head and chest, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it does look rather flat and you won't achieve that nice variation in values, meaning lights and darks, and some of the details might be lost without having multiple layers. More importantly, a one layer approach is actually more difficult if you think about it. You kind of have to capture everything at once and there's so many opportunities for making a mistake or getting the colors wrong, letting the paint flow in places that you don't want it to flow, which is why I do always recommend a lot of glazing and a multi-layer approach. And if you really want to dive deep into the art of glazing, check out this video I created using a rose as an example. This, this is a great demo, especially if you are into botanical art. I've linked the list of pigments, paper, and the brushes in the video description below. Thank you for watching and painting with me. I will see you soon.